You know, there are those who live in inclement weather uh, regions where maybe they can't get through for some reason or another, but uh, there are very few reasons why you can't get to church in Southern California, at least in my, you know, you know 42 years of living. Wait, what? Hey. Amen. I'll just see who's listening, that's it. <laughs> Okay. Well, it's good to be with you. Um, for those of you who knew, um, I went through about a week ago this last Friday with a kidney stone that was uh, that wanted to fight, and uh, I went at it and it knocked me out. I was a TKO pretty quick. <laughs> I was in the emergency room with this kidney stone. Uh, of course, I didn't know it was then what it was then. But long story short, the reason I couldn't preach last week is. I didn't. Sh I wasn't sure what was up or down yet, and I was dry heaving so much I couldn't even talk anymore. So thank you, Jason, for coming up here last week with just a couple days' notice <clears throat> and teaching uh, partly on on the beginning of the book of James. And I know you'll come back in the future and teach more on the book of James. So that said, I'm back here because my voice is partly back, um, and so I'm happy to talk about some things that I think are very important in light of when we think of end time events and we've talked about some of those things uh, and uh, we'll get back to some of those things specifically. This is, this is an issue that's kind of a, a sidebar to that or, or I should say it runs parallel. Is this better to do it more like this? Okay. Is that better? Or no? Okay. Hang on. Okay, is that better? Okay. So, anyway, so um, uh, th this is kind of a, a, a side issue, but not really a side issue. It's a, it's a primary issue, but it isn't one we might think about. Uh, well, l let me move forward with, with this idea. Um, I... I'm an avid cigar smoker. I love cigar, good cigars. I don't like cheap cigars, no offense. Uh, so over the years, I've done that. And somebody once asked me, well, what guy is smoking cigars? I said, well, many years ago, I, I was on a scene. Now, let me back up just a little bit. I've been a chaplain for 28 years. I'm on the verge of retiring. They know that, so I'm out a lot less. I went out last week, but I get out a lot less because they know I'm stopping so to speak but they still need my assistance here and there so I was called out but some many many years ago uh, I was on a scene and I was inside of a house where there was deceased bodies that had been there for some time and there's an, an odor and a smell that goes inside your cavities it's hard to get rid of that and so one of the officers said go smoke a cigar and I did and I haven't stopped since but it came from a very ugly beginning, so to speak. And over and in my, the first part of my years, um, most of the scenes I was called on were through being connected to detectives, and they were all very ugly scenes. And you started to see the depravity of man. I started to see the depravity of man, what man can do to each other and what they do to themselves. And then, and then uh, I went to the Riverside uh, Sheriff's Academy and got some special training, some other things, blah, blah, blah. I became a certified uh, Department of Justice chaplain. Some other things went in there. But I, something happened to my brain. In my brain at that stage of the game, when I had young kids, it was like this. I started to have like scary episodes in my head. And I didn't want my, I started, I started finding myself trying to get my kids to retreat from things of life that were normal inside. I'm screaming, no, you can't go. And I had to go, oh yeah, go ahead. But I started realizing that there were men and people out there that didn't think like me or like you. And, and, and then eventually I might've even said that to some of the older ones. There's people out there who don't think like us. Be careful. <laughs> and I had this heightened sense of fear that began to over me and I went through a season by which I had these 
circular thoughts and, and ideas that were always about, you know, death and dying to those I loved. It didn't bother me if somebody else died. In fact, I had no problem with the fact that people went through tragedies as long as that tragedy didn't hit me. As soon as it hit me, it was like, oh God, why? As long as it's not me, it, I don't ask God that question. Well, I kind of grew out of that, of course, and I had to work through some things in my own personal life. Kind of worked that out. Well, that was many, many years ago, really. Um, hard to remember. But I was remember it, remembering that because I want to talk to you a little bit about this idea of uh, not necessarily mental health, but the idea of our mental capacities as to where the devil works. There are three major health organizations, the uh, American Academy of Pediatrics, the American College of Emergency Physicians, and the Emergency Nurses Association, who have jointly issued a letter expressing concern over the growing crisis of children with mental health issues seeking emergency care in hospitals ill-equipped to handle their needs. The CDC, which is uh, the big national organization regarding disease and control, I'm not sure what you think of them, but nonetheless, uh, they have reported that we are now in the highest rate of suicide since the dawn of World War II. Now, I didn't even know that there was that surge in suicide in the dawn of World War II, but we've exceeded that now by quite a bit, and that was over 100 years ago. It is now the second highest form of death, suicide, for those between the ages of 25 to 54. The second highest rate. When I went on a call, it was a suicide. I do a funeral service this Friday. It's a suicide. In the last 10 years of my chaplaincy, most of my calls have not been the tragedy of accidents, though there have been them. It's been suicide calls. Suicide rate has gone way up. The report highlights the alarming increase in emergency department visits by children and youth with mental and behavioral health emergencies in the United States over the past decade. It also notes a rise in the prevalence of depression and suicide among pediatric patients. This kids. I could go on and on reading some of these things that I really don't care to. But what's really alarming is the answer to it. It's just as alarming as the fact that people take their lives. And you have to imagine that when someone takes their lives, they're really at the end of it all, and they, they are completely hopeless. And, and it also is a very um, terrible thing to do to those who remain. Uh, it's one of the worst things you can do. If you're really angry and you hate people, go kill yourself because you will damage them for a long time. When I first was on scenes, I, I, that was in my head. I, I knew that through the psych training I had had and the degree I had, I thought this was evil and hatred that this person put on these people that now have come upon this scene and have to deal with the ramifications of this, perkin, uh, this person taking their lives. But and though that's true still for me, <clears throat> I feel terrible for them as well because at some point they were, they were so, so hopeless that they couldn't see out of their darkness. Now, the, you know, I don't want you to get all depressed because <laughs> Christ is here. That's why you're here. By the way, I, I love when you come on Sundays because I work hard to, to present something to you. So when you're not here, it really makes me mad. Because I work really hard for you, you don't show up. No, I'm teasing. I'm not mad. But it, it is. But I do believe. But I do believe that God is preparing something for those who come. That He has something to say to you. And and, and what He has to say to you is is what's real. What's real is death. But what's just as real is life. 
And what's just as real is that for the Christian, there is not ultimate death. That never wins. Christ wins. The resurrection wins. Heaven wins. And the Bible is very clear about that in its various scriptures. But I want to tell you that as we come to the end time events or as we're moving towards the end times, and by the way, we can gauge everything according to the Western culture. We tend to be a little bit narcissistic that way. It's all about us. There have been many cultures, I think, throughout the world where something's happening. They might think, this, this is end time stuff. Worse than what we're going through. You can only imagine what some people have had to go through in, in light of their they're thinking of end times, the Christians who were involved, again, with, you know, the, the Nazi German Holocaust issues and, and the issues in Asia and, and other places where, where, again, tragedy is struck in such a way you have to go, it's the end, the end is here. And it feels like that here, but it doesn't mean that we're at the end. But we're moving certainly towards the end. We're clear about that. They were closer to the end. And other things have come up that allows us to realize the capacity that Satan has to address a whole world, not just a part of the world. And so the globalization is part of end time events. And I've taught about that. So without getting into that, the fact of the matter is, is that all the more what's highlighted is where the real war is taking place in the minds and hearts of people. Bad ideas will always have bad consequences. Bad ideas will always lead to bad actions, and bad actions will always lead to terrible consequences. And we are now seeing the ramification of really bad ideas coming out of our major universities. That out of our major universities, you have a whole group of people who are never taught history to see what socialism and communism does. So that we have an American soccer team of women who half of them don't even salute the flag, but in fact degrade it. Where every other country is, is hooping and hawing about their country, ours stands there in this brokenness because we're systemically racist and because in all the other lies that have come out of our colleges. And so when you see that, you go, there is a demise in our country. And the idea that there is no God is taking over our country so that we have more and more hopeless generations when they talk about why is there more suicide, you know one of their primary answers is because people are more depressed. Duh. That is so stupid. Don't tell me people are more depressed. Tell me why they're depressed. The real question is why are people so depressed? Not people are depressed. People are so depressed because they're training them that there is no God and there is no hope. They're training them to disassociate with real community so that when you're stuck on computers, by the way, as much as I can, stop letting your children be stuck to iPhones or computers where they think they're a part of community where they're not. How I love when the kids come here because you want, and, the, and there's a great little video on the swim, you want children to build community and to see the value of the body of Christ. We have less people who are part of community organizations, including at the very top, churches, Kiwanis clubs, Rotary clubs, any kind of clubs, they've gone down. There's a book, I forgot the name, I think it's called Bowling Alone. It's the idea of, of, of bowling teams leaving and now people are bowling alone. It's the idea of being alone, that more and more people are alone. So people are depressed. People are depressed because, because we as a, as a culture have destroyed community, including the church. 
but all the community issues where you need people. God has made us for people. What were the, what's the first line that we could read in the scriptures regarding Adam? It is not good for a man to be alone. So God has always given us relationship. He's given us the church. He's given us the body. When we're, ba- when we're talking about baptism, by the way, we're not showing the date with the 17th, the 20th, but we'll give you the date eventually. But in September, when we have a baptism, you're not just baptized into Christ. You're baptized into the body of Christ. You're no longer alone unless you choose to be. And I want to encourage you to not choose to be alone because the church needs you and you need the church. We were built for community. And when you suck that out of the people as you suck out God from the people as a cultural norm or teaching or vibe or cultural mind, you create loneliness, aloneness, and depression. You know what the terrible thing is about pornography? Not just all the kind of things that you would think about regarding what's being done behind the scenes to the women and the men who are involved with all that stuff. But it gives a complete false sense of being connected to somebody. The real insidious danger isn't just the lusting and all of that that goes on, but it is the insidious nature that you really are connecting because when you're all through and you feel all good about, about your sexual activity, you are finding yourself completely alone. And those people kill themselves. We find that when people take their lives that they have a whole line of these kinds of things that have been, again, just their own lives, but they're really alone. And addicts, are really alone. But their sin never is. Our sin is rippling through our culture. So we must learn to subject our thought life to Jesus. It's really coming to that idea of our minds. There's all kinds of personality disorders, by the way. Another thing that prompted me to say some of these things to you this morning is that I got a phone call from uh, uh, a pastor from another place and, and uh, they were talking and asking me about some things uh, re- regarding um, some issues and said I have this recurring thought I can't get rid of it and here's what's going on and we talked about these thoughts and, and then uh, kind of kiddingly they said uh, you know someone said I'm OCD. I said, yeah, you are. I said, I've known it all along. So what? That's what's made you successful in these areas of your life. But it's also making you suffer in these other areas of your life. Obsessive compulsive disorder, they're just one of many. I used to, by the way, if you came to counseling back in the day when I was doing more of that, I had tests for you and I could kind of help you discern what your personality disorder was. By the way, you all have one. You do. You all have some disorder, some personality disorder. If you spend enough time with me, I'll tell you what it is. <laughs> and, and we all have it, you know, but, but it's when that personality disorder takes over your life when it's a problem. Otherwise, let that be what your strength is. Let let the compulsion be a good one. Let it be thoughtful. But in this case, somebody is ruminating over negative things and they can't get out of that. So we have to talk about that. And, And again, there's all kinds of personality disorders. The fact of the matter is there's a battle for the mind. And Satan's gonna fight you there. By the way, in psychology, we love labeling you because now we can kind of help you control it and we can control it and we can charge you more money because you got OCD or you're schizoid or you're f- name the phobia and, and once you name it we can kind of attach some dollar to that and, and begin to kind of kind of work we're going to do therapy for a long time well 
I don't want to get down on the, the profession. The fact of the matter is, is that we all have some kind of disorder and it's just how you negotiate that and manage that before God. And when it takes over, get help. That's what community's for. Don't pretend like you don't have some kind of personality disorder. You have one. And when it overtakes you, go, I'm struggling in this area. Oh, let's, let's work on it. That's what I love about CR is that the, all the people here are just those who've admitted it or it got so heavy that it, it began to allow them to not function in life anymore in a way that was healthy. And so we, we have each other to help one another get through all of that. But let me read a passage to you. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh. They are not merely human. <laughs> this is not a mere battle between one philosopher with some human wisdom against another philosopher with some human wisdom. But the weapons of our warfare have divine power to destroy strongholds. I've said this before, we'll just touch on it, but in our family histories, there are strongholds of sin that have taken hold of us. And when it rears its head in your life, it's your responsibility, responsibility as a Christian to go, ah, there it is. And I'm not going to let it overtake me or destroy my family. And so we confess it. The strength of the Christian is to be able to tell the truth. That's what happens. That's what sets us free. Christ came to set us free. And the freedom is that we can recognize something we didn't recognize before, what sin is. We can admit it and go, God, this is, and we confess before God, and then we confess before each other, and we find healing there. We, we find that it's not, it's not healthy to hide anymore, not healthy to sit in our little corner and pretend anymore. But when we begin to confess it, becomes released in our lives we begin to do things that are able to be helpful to our families not just ourselves when we tell the truth Paul says in 2 Corinthians 10.5 I just read you 10.4 we destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and second we take every thought captive. What does that mean? Well, in a personal way, it means that we bring our thoughts and we subject them under Jesus. First of all, know that Jesus knows all your thoughts. So stop hiding your thoughts from Him. It's important that you confess before God, first of all, before God. And at some point when you have strength to do it, you may have to confess it to some other loving brother or sister. If you're a brother, confess it to a brother. If you're a sister, confess it to a sister. Or find a good pastor who will do that. There's a couple churches who have some. You're supposed to say, you're one, Larry. <laughs> I was setting it up to kind of build myself up and it didn't happen. Yeah, that's my personality disorder. He needs constant patting on the back. So, we find our, our ability to find freedom in what God reveals to us to be what isn't subjected to Christ. And so our thoughts, as we see them, we have to see them as not being out there and, and not under, you know, God's ability to, to, to see it. But that's where our real battle is. It's the battle of the mind and the heart. By the way, in the Greek, when the Bible talks about the heart, when the Bible says, if I were to say, do you follow your heart? I don't mean follow your emotions or your feelings. That's what the world would, would say. Follow your heart. What do you ever you feel, honey? Big trouble. Because your feelings lie to you all the time. And if you ate a bad burrito, and you're going to follow your heart, you may just do the wrong thing. Because your feelings are off. They're just off. When I say follow your heart, I'm talking about the biblical heart. That is a heart connected to God. 
the seat of the will, the seat of thought, the seat of emotion, that's the heart. That's the cardia that the Greek talks about, that the Bible talks about. It's the seat of those things. And when you come to Christ and surrender that to Christ, because it's subjected to Him, that's how we live our lives. Don't follow your emotions. You'll be in big trouble. So Paul says, we destroy these arguments that are against God and His knowledge. He's talking about how they've refuted those who are trying to take God away. But the personal part is that we're called to also subject our thoughts to God. So first of all, know that He knows your thoughts. And then you have power over your thoughts. It may take some work for you OCD people. But you can choose to bring your thoughts under the kingship of Christ. Choosing to live by faith can feel daunting this side of heaven where spiritual forces abound and the enemy prowls around like a lion. For it tells us in 1 Peter 5, 8, be sober and watchful because your adversary the devil walks around as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Is he going to devour your flesh? Eventually he wants to. He wants to devour all of you, but he wants to devour your heart, your seat of thought, your seat of will, your, your seat of emotion. He wants to devour you in your brain matter. He wants you to believe lies. He is the liar and the father of lies. And many of us have lived lies, or rather, lives according to lies. When we come to Jesus, we begin to know the truth, and we begin to learn to live according to the truth and not the lie. You lived according to the old truth that was really a lie. I'm nothing. I'm nobody. Unless, unless people think I'm this and I pretend to be that. Or unless I give myself to men and they like me because I do that. Unless I you know, spend a lot of money on women and they think I'm that. Unless I, unless I you know, steal from my friends or, do that or, or I'm part of them, then I'm accepted. And we have all these lies we live according to. But you come to Jesus and you have new identity. You have new family. You have a new identity. And you have a new destiny. And so we begin to live according to the truth and not the old lies. That's part of how the roaring lion seeks to devour you in your thought life. In Ephesians 6, a very familiar passage Finally, my brothers, be strong in the Lord and the strength or the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For our fight is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, and against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to resist the devil, and having done all, to stand and to stand firm. It's talking about a way of thinking, a way of believing. You see, do you understand that? It's in this metaphor of war and battle, but that battle is inside your heart. You're not out on the battlefield. The battlefield is in you. And it's the truth that wins. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to resist the evil day and having done all to stand I had to say this to myself back way back in the day. Yeah, there are evil men out there. But there are strong men too. And there's a God who's stronger than the evil. And fear is not my motivating factor. Faith and love is. And I had to remind myself of that. 
I had to work through that. So I didn't retreat and become afraid and make my kids afraid. It didn't work with Luke. He's scared to death of lizards. <laughs> but that's his mother's fault. That's another sermon. But you don't want your children or your grandchildren to grow up being afraid and living according to fear. Let's not go to church. Why it might rain today? <laughs> we could get an accident. Yeah, you could. All those things are true. You could get an accident. You, the, something bad could happen to you. All that stuff could happen. But you got to live. You can't be afraid of relationships and never get married because then you'll never know the best of love either. You can't be afraid to say, we're not going to have kids. Why? Because children get hurt and they, they're going to die one day too. Yeah. But get them to know Jesus and frank, frankly, you'll never know the greatest of loves unless you're willing to have them if you can. But don't be moved by fear. Be moved by love and faith. Be moved by the Spirit. Pray in the Spirit in verse 18. Pray in the Spirit always with all kinds of prayer and supplication. To that end, be alert with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. In other words, don't stop praying. Don't give up because that's where the battle is. When you have a friend or a loved one that comes to your head, pray for them. Continue to pray for them. So there's a battle that's being waged in their hearts and minds, not just yours. And we're called to help each other in the community of God's people that He's called us to. We're called to pray, to be alert, to persevere. And when it says supplication, that means specific prayer. Don't just, you know, we're in a hurry. Oh God, uh, I lift up my brother unto you. you know, because we're lazy, we're in a hurry, stop. Get in a corner. Do your best to lift up your brother to you or your sister to, you, to, to the Lord. Um, you, you need to take time to pray real prayers to the Lord. Rise up and activate your whole being. Let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles us and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. It really is about your mind being in truth. Learn to release your thoughts through confession. Let us not run with pers- let us run with perseverance and race marked out for us. That means take note, be intentional about living for Jesus. If your thoughts start imprisoning you in doubt or fear or worry, it can feel like a tidal wave or a brick wall is forming and suffocating your life. I like the song Can't Make Me Doubt. Well, it's not really that accurate of a song. No offense. It's a nice song. There's no sin in doubting. The sin is when you continue to doubt and not ever work that out. It's when you doubt and you let the doubt remain so that it really is what your life is. But doubt is there to bring you to Jesus to to again remind you of what really is. Oh yeah, there are things in life that can make you doubt, but you don't stay in the doubt. You're called to rise to faith, to work that out before God, and God will work that out in you. It's not a sin to doubt, it's a sin to remain in the doubt. Work it out. Know that that doubt is saying something to you, and God wants to drive you to his own heart. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and find release in your thought life. 
tell God what you're thinking and you'll hear yourself. If you can, even start journaling. I know it's a hard thing because it's, it's a practice that you're not used to. Anything, any change like that is hard. I went to the doctor because now they're going to operate to take out the stone, blah, blah, blah. Didn't and, uh, and he's going over some things. He goes, yeah, yeah, you're in pretty good shape, da, 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 but, but you need vitamin D. I go, Why can't I just get it from the sun? Because you don't already. And for you to, to go out in the sun and do this to get vitamin D ain't going to happen because you ain't going to change. People don't change. So just take vitamin D. Well, I want to change. I want to go out. Yeah, but you're not going to change. <laughs> just take vitamin D. Can, can you tell what kind of nationality he was? <laughs> yeah, I don't get a second opinion. Yeah, you're ugly too. <laughs> That's an old joke. So, a great way to take every thought captive is by creating an ability to see what the truth is right in front of you. So we memorize scriptures. A good practical thing is to put significant scriptures down on little cards or, um, or, or uh-oh, floods. Turn off your phones. You're going to get a flood watch. I know. <laughs> so, the thing is, is that, is that it's the Word of God that, that replaces our lives with truth. So if you don't memorize Scripture well, and that's, by the way, intentional, then get Scripture in card form that you can read them over and over again. You can buy, actually, Scripture cards, but I invite you to just go get index cards and write out your favorite Scriptures. Just take, you know, every afternoon, take 20 minutes to, to find significant scriptures that mean something to you and write them down and keep them there and then you'll begin to, to read them. If you need some, I'll give you scriptures. Or start reading to the book of John or the book of James and, and you'll find significant, it's all significant, but you're going to find something that speaks to you. Write them down so that you can look at them and go, here's the truth when the lies come your way. Your thoughts control your lives, but we can control our thoughts. We're reminded in Proverbs 4, be careful what you think because your thoughts run your life. Be alert to what you're thinking. Be alert to what's the lie that you're speaking to yourself. When you have negative emotions, don't just go with the emotion. Go, why am I thinking that? This is an important thing because it's hard for us to do it. Why, you're going to say, why am I feeling that? I'm sorry, not thinking. Why am I feeling that? What's the thought before my feelings? Feelings don't come from fiat. They come from thought. Feelings come from the way that you think. So you want to go, what am I thinking? I'm feeling this. Why am I feeling that? What am I thinking? And then you go, is that thought Biblical? I mean, where does that fit into to my relationship with, with Jesus? You want to have the feeling and, and, and confess it to be what it is. Feelings in themselves aren't bad or good. They're just what they are. It's your thoughts that are bad or good. <laughs> you have to look at those thoughts and go, here's that thought. It's a bad thought it's, it, because it's not a true thought. Or you may go, no, that's a true thought. <laughs> but you need to work that out. So don't just try to change feelings because you won't be able to do that. You want to know what the thought is behind your thoughts, what your thoughts are behind the feelings. Does that make sense? Yes. I want to fumble at that. I just want you to be able to ask yourself. And that's a habit you, that you don't have. Most of you don't have that habit, but you need to think of things that way. You know, what am I thinking? On the way here this morning, I was thinking things that weren't all that good in some regards and, and I just had to keep my mouth shut because I had to go why am I thinking that why am I thinking that I, I mean I was thinking literally that on the way here why am I thinking that well here's why and, and I need to change that in fact if I'm going to address it I need to address it differently than the way I normally do which is kind of being the 
the, you know, the bull guy gets heads like that and says things and, and little things that are little stabbings here and there to let you know that I think you're off. No offense, honey, it wasn't about you. Yeah, <laughs> of course, she was the only one riding with me. <laughs> But we have to think through and, and talk less and be affirming in our conversations. To be uplifting. Am I empowering people or am I taking power away from them? Am I empowering people or am I making them feel small so I can feel like I know something they don't? Am I serving them or am I wanting to be up here with them because I have my stuff that I have to think through better. Why can't I be here, Christ-like? Why do I always have to be here? Think about the things that you feel. Paul says in Romans 12 too, that you can, that you can change your heart and your mind. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way that you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect, because God has come to transform the way that you think. Because that's the battle. Gosh, time flies. The battle of your brain. That's where Satan wants to mess you up. And it's often going to be the message of the culture, the message of the day is going to throw that out to you. As I've said many times to you, I don't watch, in general, regular TV. That is, Channel 2, 4, 5, 7, 11, all the ones I used to watch. I don't watch that. But with the storm thing... I thought, I'm going to watch, I'm going to find the local, that local channel. I think it's, it was channel five. And I'm going to see what they're saying about the storm. It was so funny. Because it was so sensationalized. And because I was away from it for so many years, that when I go back to it, I go, I, I really want to laugh. <laughs> it's so funny. You know, here's a scene from San Clemente. Three o'clock this morning. And it's kind of like drizzling. It's just sprinkling now but the storm's coming. And I go, Therese, like, and she's laughing too. This is sprinkles. It's coming. Hillary's coming. It's going to be this. It's going to be that. It's gonna, oh my gosh. And, but it was so obvious that it was, it was funny. Now some of you who watch it all the time, it ain't funny to you because to you that's it. I'm going to ask you to step away. <laughs> step away. Get back. Step away. No, sorry. <laughs> so the thing is, is that, you know, sometimes you have to get perspective to go, oh, that's what's being said. That's how that's being done. And they want to drive fear into you. And, and, and they want readership and, and, you know, viewership. So they're going to keep going, watch us, because we got the next thing coming. It's already, by the way, here's another thing. That, it's already, it's, it's already become a deadly storm. One dies in Mexico. One dies in Mexico and it's a deadly storm? Maybe he had a heart attack. I, I don't know. And tragedy for that one life. I'm not demeaning the one life. I demean the fact that the media takes that one life and goes, it's already a deadly storm. One life killed somewhere in Mexico, we think. <laughs> it's kind of like that. You kind of go, oh my gosh. What, what are they trying to drive in us? Fear, 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 fear. And, and, and we want to be, and we want drama because most people don't have their own lives. They've retreated to an alone life and now the drama's got to come from outside of them. So we're going to, we're here where we've, end, where we started. Because the world is becoming more alone, they need stimulation from the outside that isn't really theirs. So constantly the culture is going to offer you stimulation and you're going to need that government, whatever they're providing for you. 
you want to find real drama, and I don't mean this in the negative sense, though it could be, but real drama within the fact that you're connected to real life. Because we're connected with each other. Now, I don't mean become a gossiper because you know about so-and-so. I mean, become a positive dramatist when you're praying for somebody because you really know what their ills are or their hurts or their struggles or someone's praying for you. When you're talking about real ideas, when, when you're going to talk about, about stuff that matters, stuff that counts, what, what you're going in, what, what you... I went to a bookstore in San Clemente. Me and my wife were there. We went to a bookstore um, with, uh, with uh, my kids, a couple of my kids, and we were in the store, and I, and I loved it, just being there, talking to, to, the, to the lovely young lady behind the clerk, you know, saying, well, I said, what are you reading right now? Oh, and she wanted to tell me what she's reading, and what are you reading? I go, well, you know, I, I kind of, I teach the Bible, so like, I, I like reading history, I like reading these things, oh, and then we were talking about the things we're reading, what really matters, and, and where life is going, I could share the gospel with her a little bit in my own way. I mean, go create drama. You go get coffee somewhere every day. Now, if you're going to be the cultural person, you're just going to drive through and go, eh. <laughs> I want to invite you to stop. I stop and I go in. Why? I can see faith. Hi, and I can say a couple of things to them. I can be in relationship with them. I know. I have girls. They, their hair is up. They got sunglasses on like this because they have nothing on and they're going to, you know, you don't see them underneath. They have the pajamas on. They're driving through. And they go, eh, and they go. But when you can, go in. Get to know your barista. I love grocery shopping. I like it. I love it. I, I just, I want to find some reason to go to Albertsons. I want to find some reason to go to Stater Brothers. I like going shopping, looking around, buying a little of this, a little of that, and then, and then getting to know the people that I'm, you know, saying hi to or whatever. I mean, get connected. Yeah, get connected. Because there's a real battle for your mind. That's where we want to end. There's a real battle for your mind. And Satan wants to enslave it to something that's outside of you. So you really aren't intentional about your joy, about your relationships, about your life, about your service about what it means to be like Jesus in real relationship. He wants to take that away from you and make you alone. Where you need the stimulation of a culture and not a God within you who wants to drive you by his love and faith to do his work on earth. There's so much to do because we're in the end. We're closer to the end. And it's a battle for your mind. Let's pray. Jesus, help us to bring our thoughts in subjection to you so that we might indeed find ourselves speaking truth and being in a way, Lord, where we're adding to life what it means to walk with you, to be those committed to you because you've committed yourself to us. And because you've given us new identity and a new destiny. Lord, help us to give this message in real life and not to retreat in the loneliness of a culture who has failed, Lord, to see you for who you are. And Lord, we pray against the spirit of the evil one who seeks to blind our culture here around us, Lord, with, with, with a, a real sense blind them from having a real sense of who you are and what you've called them to. Lord, help us to have strength, spiritual strength to, find, to fight the battle in such a way, Lord, that we find victory not just for ourselves, but to help others find victory in being freed from their aloneness. Thank you, Jesus, for what you're doing here in this church. Continue to empower us to reach out in your name. Amen. Please rise.